Okay, here we go. So the topic today is regularization. And let me open my little drawing pad and uh, introduce the, uh, the topic. If I can come back here. Sorry, I lost track of Zoom. Oh man, where is... Oh, this is frustrating. Okay, there we are, sorry. Okay, so come back here and share this. Um, so we've been talking about, about uh, bias and, and variance and stuff. So let's just draw the, the basic picture here. Whoa. Um, so this is um, the model complexity axis. And here is um, error. And um, so what happens with, uh, with model, with the relationship between error and model complexity, this is out of sample error. Um, so as, as a model gets more complex, uh, the error goes down and until you get to a certain part, a certain, a certain point. Um, so, um, and as this happens, um, bias goes from being very high. So here's, here's what happens to bias, whoops. So bias as a source of error goes down as the model gets more complex and variance as a source of error goes up. So variance is, um, variance is like a kind of a measure of the diversity of the hypotheses in your hypothesis class. Um, so um, if, if, uh, if there's a, a large you know, divergence of which model you get, depending on which training data you have, then that's high variance. And bias is not being able to actually fit the, uh, the, the target function f that you're trying to model. So um, a really crude way of, um, of adjusting model complexity is just with a uh, number of features. And so an example of that is like uh, the degree of the, um, the polynomial features that you're using for your model. And I, I wanna, we have, there's other ways of introducing features that I, we might get to today, um, radial basis functions, but I don't think we'll get there. But anyway, this is, this is sometimes called a hard order constraint because you're, you're sort of changing the nature of, of H itself. Um, so, um, you know, if you have, uh, if you have a, a degree three polynomial model, this is a completely different hypothesis space than a degree five polynomial model. Um, so regularization is sometimes called uh, soft constraint. And the idea with uh, regularization is, is not to completely change the hypothesis space that you're using, but to sort of um, to find this, to, to, um, to punish complex particular hypotheses. So you can talk about something called the, the augmented error, which is uh, discussed in, in the textbook. So we'll, we'll continue to use W here to just stand for a hypothesis. Um, so in the augmented error, you have um, I don't think that question was directed to me. Right. Okay. So you have the the ordinary the ordinary error that's associated with the, the hypothesis. So that's just you know the percentage of uh, misclassifications, or it's the R two score for regression, or whatever. But then you penalize somehow the complexity of um, W. So this is. Uh, this is supposed to be complexity. And you're kind of, there, there are several, several natural notions of, of how to measure the complexity um, that we will talk about. Um, so, so this is kind of like Occam's razor. Uh, you guys have probably heard of that before. So Occam's razor says the simplest explanation is the best. And it's kind of amazing that this guy, you know, had this idea in the 1100s and it's been like a guiding principle of scientific theories for centuries. But in a sub, some sense, it's kind of like mathematically literally true that the, um, 
that the simplest hypothesis that fits the training data has the best performance out of sample. Um, but there's no, there's no like, uh, you know, fixed definition of, of what complex means. Um, so what, what kind of thing can, can complexity mean? Um, so here, let's, somebody going to say something? Well, the number of features or the number of, uh, the complexity of the data itself? Yeah, number of features would be the complexity of the whole hypothesis space. Right. Um, but what we're trying to get at now is, is a measure of complexity for a particular hypothesis. So all hypotheses have the same number of features for a fixed hypothesis class. Um, so the idea is that you, you sort of leave um, the hypothesis class alone, but then you sort of, you work with, or you kind of stay within sort of a, a simple subset of, of, um, of the bigger hypothesis class. And it turns out that this reduces variance and, and often it gives a big reduction in variance with only a small increase in, in bias. Um, so here's, here's one, one way to, uh, to do this. So what if you just, uh, so maybe, you know, example one, um, so this is this is the what they what they use to introduce the idea of a soft order constraint in the book. So you you can just force w t times w to be less than or equal to a certain constant. So here this is just a, a constant c. Um, so so what is what does that mean? That means uh, this is the same thing as the the sum of squares here. So you're you're saying oh, I shouldn't have written a bar there because we're talking about the um, the members of that vector. Okay. Um, so in terms of like uh, axes or you know these this makes a, a ball like if there are just two dimensions to the weight vector w one and w two. That's saying that we're only going to consider hypotheses that um, lie inside this region. Um, so what, what's kind of interesting there is that the, the actual best hypothesis might be outside that region. So we can call this, the book calls this W bar Lin. Um, so this is, this is the actual best hypothesis. Um, so we can't, we can't quite get um, to that, but we can, we can get to the closest point here. So if you make, if you make an assumption that, um, that the error function that you're using is, is convex, um, and then you look at, if you look at a contour plot of the, the error here, what you'll see is sort of um, concentric, not, not necessarily circles, but kind of ellipses around this point here. Um, so this is like, uh, you know, mean squared error, for example, will look like this because it's, um, it's basically quadratic error. So it looks like, uh, you know, it looks like a big paraboloid. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing kind of a, um, I'm drawing a, a big paraboloid, but I'm, I'm using, I'm, I'm drawing it as a con contour plot. Um, so I have a question. Sure. What would the hypothesis be outside the, that circle that you, um, made, uh, that is blue? Um, yeah, so let's just let's just say that this this green thing here is the best hypothesis. I just assume then, that, okay. Yeah, and then that hypothesis has a the best hypothesis just for regular mean squared error or whatever error we're using for W. Um, the the thing that minimizes mean squared error on our training set happens to be this, and then this was, will be a certain distance from the origin, but we just happen to make C um, small enough that now we're constraining our, our hypothesis set to only be the W's that are inside this circle. And so that doesn't include um, W Lin. Okay. Okay. And now, now we want to do the best that we can inside this circle. So there's something kind of interesting here. Um, let's just, let's just say that uh, the best one that's inside this circle happens to be like right here, trying to make an ugly orange dot. Um, but because, but because of the, um, 
because the mean squared error has this parabolic form uh, for its error, anything on this contour line will have the same error as this orange thing. So what we can do is just kind of follow the contour line out to the edge of the circle. And then we get a hypothesis that has exactly the same error as, um, as, as this one that we initially selected. But this, this lets us make a, a simplifying algebraic assumption, which is that the, that the, best, the best constrained hypothesis is actually on the border of the circle. Um, so without loss of generality, um, you can assume that the, the best hypothesis inside um, the circle is actually on the boundary. So that means that this is um, an exact uh, equality instead of an inequality. Um, so now there's uh, another, another funny thing that, that happens. Um, if you look at the, the gradient of um, the gradient of the the error here. So let me let me draw in an, an error for that. Uh, sorry, an arrow for that. Um, so you know the the gradient is a vector that points uphill. Um, so the gradient of the circle here for this point that we found as I as I draw it is going to be something that is at a right angle to this contour line because it's pointing uphill. So this is something like you know the gradient of, of mean squared error. Um, at uh, this this particular point that we found here, which the book calls um, W reg, so I'll call it that too. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. The W reg is what we we call the one that is the best, but this one is not the best yet. Sorry about that. Okay. So the gradient points uphill, but what we want to actually do is is move not uphill but downhill. So you can look at the uh, this would be the negative of that gradient, which um, points back uh, toward the center of the circle there. Um, so this, uh, this arrow, this vector, has, has some component in, that goes in this direction, right? So this direction is, uh, is, is a direction that is tangent to the circle. Um, so what it means is um, if, this, if this green, if this green arrow that I've drawn here is not perpendicular to the border of the circle, we can actually lower our error by going a little bit in this direction because the negative gradient has some component um, which is, which is non-zero you know, in that direction. So that means that we can improve our guess by, by moving a little bit that way. Um, so now here we are. And so you can, you can just see that if I, if I take the, the gradient, the negative gradient again at this point, that arrow still has a little bit of a component in this direction so I can move even further this way. And now let's stop here. So what's gonna be special about this point is now um, the so-called normal line at, at this point on the border is pointing in exactly the same direction as the, the negative gradient. And that's the, that's the best you can do. So there's, there's no way to, to move along the border of the circle and get any better. So this is something that is gonna, gonna kind of characterize um, the best weight that's, that's inside that constrained circle. So it's gonna have the property, so let's, now let's use this notation. So W reg is um, the actual best hypothesis that's inside this circle with a, with a bounded radius. And um, what property is it going to have? It's going to have the property that the, um, that the uh, normal line to the, to the sphere here um, is um, parallel with the direction of the, the negative gradient. So let me switch to um, a different a different um, sheet here. So can I open? I can discard those changes, I guess. So, so the green line will have like the best gradient, right? The, the last line that you drew along um, the border line. Yeah, that's right. So well, the the green it'll have the lowest error. So the the one right. yeah the the point on the on the so first of all we can assume that the solution is on the border. And then the solution on the border that has the lowest error 
is the one where the tangent line, uh, sorry, the, the normal line is pointing sort of directly toward um, the, the true best hypothesis, which is outside the circle. So this will be a right angle. Okay. But then the very... I'm sorry? Yuri, you cut out a little bit before you could finish your question. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, but the variance would increase because you moved along the border line and we didn't like d directly go from the starting point of the best of the best. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. So we're giving it by, by restricting our, restricting the possibilities to being inside the circle, we're sort of giving ourselves like a variance budget. You know, so we're, what we're doing by going to the border here is we're going to the to the to the end of our budget. We want to sort of spend all the uh, all the credits that we have, but that's okay because we're still um, we're still restricting ourselves to at most considering a hypothesis that you know is is that far from the origin. So just distance from the origin is what we're using as complexity here. So this is the sort of the best one that we can afford given the way we've constrained ourselves here. Moving to the edge does use more of the budget, but it's still within the budget. Um, so there's this equation right here. Um, and it says that the, the gradient, so, so now this, this equation will be true for W equals W reg, which is the, the best hypothesis that's um, inside, the, inside the circle. It's gonna be true that the, the gradient at that point is gonna be now this is a fancy way of saying uh, perpendicular to the direction of the uh, the vector. So here, here's the, I have to cheat a little bit because my diagram is not perfect. So this is the vector, you know, W reg itself. And what, what this equation is saying is that it points in exactly the same direction as the gradient. And then what this, uh, it's, it's negative because we want it to actually point downhill, whereas the, grad, the gradient naturally wants to point uphill, so we need to make it negative. And this two is just a, a, is a mathematical convenience. And what this, what this lambda here does is it makes these vectors the, uh, the same length. So it's just a scaling factor that makes the gradient vector and the w vector be the same length. And it has a little a little subscript here C because it depends on it depends on what C is because you know if um, if C is if C is big then then W is going to be big because it it lives on the the border of C so I mean the border of the circle with radius C okay so I hope all that makes makes sense <laughs> um, so there's there's an amazing an amazing fact here. Um, so uh, assume assume that this is this is true. I, I think I left out a step in, in this derivation. Um, so let me just move this back over to the other side of the equality here. So the gradient of E N W um, plus two lambda C W is equal to uh, zero. All right. So now what, what, this, what this does is it, it takes kind of the, the anti-gradient, if that's a thing, of this point. So, so notice that if you, do take the, if you did take the gradient of this, you would just get that. Um, if you don't see why that's true, just trust me, it's true. So the gradient of this that I just put the little mustache under, the gradient of this would be that. And so that means that the gradient of this entire expression here is, is equal um, to zero. So it, it turns out that this, this idea that we had about restricting all the hypotheses to being inside a circle here is amazingly the same as, as this idea. The idea of using an augmented error function um, that just, uh, that, that penal so here's the, here's the complexity penalty. Now we'll, we're going to consider the complexity penalty um, this, and what that is, is just the sum of the squares of the, um, of the, what am I trying to think of? Dimensions. Okay, so this is sort of like, this is just a measure of the size of that vector. So what we've done is we've, we've come, 
from we've gone from one point of view to a different point of view. So we're going to do regularization in this picture by keeping W inside this circle. But um, through this mathematical argument that we just gave, that turns out to be equivalent to the idea of using an augmented error, which is our regular error plus a complexity penalty, where the complexity is the size of the weight vector. And now from this point of view, this, this constant lambda, um, this is going to be an, the degree to which we, we punish complicated solutions. So if lambda is a, is a big positive, then we're going to punish complicated solutions a lot. And um, the smallest, we're going to let lambda be a zero. And if lambda is zero, then we don't, public, we don't punish complex solutions at all. And what we have is just the augmented error is the same as the in sample error. So it's, it's, there's no regularization at all. So this, um, this formula is sometimes called weight decay or, or ridge regression. And like we were just explaining that the size of lambda is what controls the, uh, the amount of regularization here. Okay. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, so any, any questions before we go on to the next, next part of the lecture? All right. Um, so now what we're going to do is, is actually figure out what W is in the case of um, linear regression. So you remember in, in linear regression, we were, we, when we first talking, were talking about it, we wanted to solve the equation, um, the end sample error of um, W is equal to zero. And then we were actually able to solve that, and it turned out to be um, the pseudo inverse of X uh, times Y. So we're going to do a trick like that again, except now we have to do the same argument carrying around this complexity penalty. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Um, so I, I did this more slowly in the videos that I made for you guys. I'm going to do it. It's in the, the playlist called regularization. I'm going to do it a little bit more quickly now. Professor, I'd ask the question, Jeff. Oh, OK. Let me. Let me um, can I see chat from here? I think I have to stop screen sharing before I can go to the chat. Could you just read it? Yeah, yeah, no, you could just, yeah, she asked, is lambda a, a hyperparameter? Yes, yes, lambda is a hyperparameter. And I figured out how to bring up the chat. Um, so um, lambda is sort of our first example of a hyperparameter. I don't think we've talked about one before. Um, so a hyperparameter is, is something that you, you choose to sort of um, adjust which hypotheses inside the bigger hypothesis class you're actually going to consider or prioritize. And so it's sort of like a way of tuning the bias variance trade-off. And you can't select it just on the basis of performance on the, the training data. Um, so you find the, you find the hyperparameter that, that gives the best performance on the test sample, and then you you select that, and this is all part of a, a process called model selection, which um, which we'll we'll talk about explicitly and at some point. Um, but here here's the here's the the derivation. Um, so this is just the same argument that we gave when we were doing this I don't know months ago in class, but now we have to carry around this thing here. We take the gradient of both sides. And notice that the gradient of this, like we kind of said earlier, becomes this. And if you want to know why, you can watch the, uh, the longer video on this derivation. And um, then it turns out that you can rearrange this and, and factor out W. And anyway, you solve, you solve for W here, and you get, um, you get this equation. So people often write this like this without um, the one over n's. And that's because you can, um, you can just rescale w. <laughs> so if you, do, if you do w over n here, this is like the literal truth. And um, you, know, you, can use, you can use this formula if you want to. You're, uh, you're going to get slightly different um, lambdas if you divide by n. But, so there's been like a, res lambda has been rescaled by, by n. 
And um, that, that kind of makes sense because if n is big, you need less regularization. Um, so we could, have, we could have just done that in the first place. But with sort of with the understanding that with, um, with bigger n, we're going to need less regularization, we could have kind of just de defined this factor to be some constant divided by n in the first place. But so in practice, what we do is we have this expression, and then, and then we, we try a bunch of different lambdas. And usually, we just care about order of magnitude. So you know, you could try lambda in, um, you know, try 10 to the minus 6, um, 10 to the minus 5th, um, you know, 10 to the minus 4th, all the way up to, you know, um, 10 squared or something. So now you try eight or nine possible values of, of uh, lambda, and you see which one does the best on the test set, and then we consider that one to be the, the, best, the best version of that. Um, hyperparameter. So outside of linear regression, this is this is the the basic form of the the gradient of the augmented error. It's just the gradient of the regular error plus uh, this term. So if you're if you're going to adjust gradient descent or a stochastic gradient descent, you need to adjust your gradient function, and the adjustment that you need to add is just this term. It's very easy. Okay, so that's the um, that's the end of, of this argument. Sorry, that was kind of kind of mathematical. And now we're going to do some more um, sort of uh, code 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 based stuff. So let me go to my um, to my browser, uh, which is not that. Oops. And where is it? It's the academic calendar. I think it's disguised right now as the academic calendar. Okay. Um, so this is kind of frustrating because the zoom controls are always right over the tabs. But let's um, let's look at this. And I think I need to stop and reshare. Something got a little wonky. Okay. So what we just did is um, so there's a there's a name a name for this. <laughs> If um, if you're just doing if you're doing linear models and you're doing linear regression, then then this this formula which we just gave for the augmented error is something called ridge regression, um, and and so we just we kind of without much justification we picked this way of punishing of, of describing complexity. We said that complexity was the sum of the squares. Um, so the sum of the squares is. Uh, you can express it mathematically like this. So it's the square of the Euclidean norm, um, which is also sometimes called the L2 norm. Um, but another way to punish the size of the weight vector might be just to add up all the, um, the absolute value of all the weights. So th because the purpose of the square here is really just to make it positive. So what if you just use absolute value here instead of squares? Um, so that is um, a choice that people often make, and when you're doing um, when you're doing re regression, this is called lasso. So ridge here's the equation for what, what's called ridge re regression, um, and this is the this is the form of the error function for what's called lasso regression. And the um, it makes a it makes a pretty big difference. They both have um, advantages and, uh, and disadvantages. So um, this picture, which is unfortunately a little bit too large. Oh man, okay, all right, this is getting smaller. Ooh, go down, go down. Um, so this is, this is the same picture that I, that I, I drew before, um, but they're using they're using beta instead of w. So what this beta hat is, is the very best parameter. Um, so we call that w lin in the picture that we drew a moment ago. So for, for most error functions, you know, there is an error function that is kind of like a maybe quadratic error function, definitely quadratic in the case of linear regression. So the, the now we think about the place where, where it touches um, the, uh, 
the edge of the constraint set is going to be kind of like an arbitrary place here in the case of ridge regression, where ridge regression was the case where we said that we were just going to pick the best one on the border of the, uh, the circle. Um, but the, uh, the form of, of the, um, the constraint is a little bit different in the case of lasso. Um, so what, you know, over here when, when we're doing this kind of constraint, every, what is it that everything on the, the boundary of the circle has in common? everything on the boundary of the circle has the same distance from the origin. So that means the same L2 norm, if you care to read up on L1 and L2 norms. Um, so that's what makes it circular, because everything on, in, a, in a contour level has the same distance from the origin. Um, so it's also true over here in this diamond shape, but it's, um, it's not the ordinary notion of distance. It's uh, what's sometimes called Manhattan distance. You know, in, can I draw on this? In Ma Manhattan distance, if you want to get from here to the origin, you can't just go straight there. You have to either go over and come down this way or go down and go over. So they call it Manhattan distance because it's just like Manhattan. You can't walk through a building. You have to go at right angles. And so it turns out that every, every point on the boundary of this diamond has the same Manhattan distance from the origin. Um, so what, what tends to happen here, clear and turn this off, okay. What tends to happen here in the case of um, the, L1, the L1 penalty is that these, um, these contour levels, so this is, Everything on, on this contour level surrounding the best, um, the best parameter is going to have the same error. So that's what these, these, can, these circles have in common, or these ellipses. Um, so there's going to there's gonna be um, something inside this diamond that, that it is on kind of the best contour level. And it's going to tend to be at, um, at the point of the diamond. And on the, the point of the diamond, one of the parameters is going to be zero. In this case, notice that beta, beta one, the beta one parameter is zero here. And in higher dimensions, you have analogous things happening. You know, in, a, in three dimensions, you would have like a, a cube instead of a square. And then in higher dimensions still, you would have hypercubes. But still, the optimum is going to tend to be on like a vertex of the hypercube, um, where a lot of the uh, the parameters are actually going to uh, be zeroed out. So um, regression with the L1 penalty is a, is is useful for what's called uh, feature selection because it tends to force certain certain features to have um, to have a value of zero, and and so the ones that are left with non-zero values at the end of this process are kind of the important ones. So that can be interesting. Um, and then there's a, a compromise between those two points of view called elastic net. We can come down here to the formulas. So here, this is the L2 penalty. This is the L1 penalty. And then the idea of elastic net is, is that you will, um, there's, there's some weighting, weighting constant R, which is also a hyperparameter. And so you, you can, by adjusting R, you can, if R is zero, then this is just L2. If R is one, then this is just L1. And if R is something like one half, then you're kind of splitting the difference and, and averaging the two notions of error. Um, so if you look at the Wikipedia article on, uh, on elastic net here, um, it points out some problems with, with lasso. So I don't know if this is worth spending so much class time on, but if you, if you have a, a matrix that is much wider than it is tall, um, then lasso doesn't work well. Um, another, another problem with lasso is, let me come back to um, another link here. So this is, this is the GitHub page of um, Ariel Geron, the, the author of, of this book. So all the, um, all the figures from the book have nice, 
um, Python notebooks that you can look through that are kind of cool. So it just happens that the one that we're interested in is is in this section on um, on linear linear models. So we have to kind of scroll through all this stuff that doesn't have to do with regularization. But here we here we get to regularization. Um, so let me make this bigger. I don't know. Okay, all right, it's fine. So um, this figure is showing um, the solution to a regression problem that happens with different choices for the regularization constant, which he calls alpha. So alpha, just like our alpha is what we call lambda. It's just some positive uh, number or non-negative number. Um, so uh, yeah, so this this must so what he's got on the left here these are these are actually just lines, and what this is what this is showing you is um, for lower lower values of regularization you can have steeper lines, but the more regularization you use with um, just a line the the less steep the uh, the slope the line in the videos I made I explain that so if this is you know, this is a speeded up version because I assume you've already watched those three YouTube videos. Over here, he's doing polynomial regression and um, we could probably scroll up and see what the degree of the polynomial is. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't immediately see. So, um, so with, uh, with, no, with no regularization, you get uh, just a, a, a very curvy polynomial, which is what you see with the blue line here. Um, but the, the more regularization you employ, the less, um, the less curvy the, the line is encouraged to be. So it can't have regions, it can't have regions even with high slope. And it kind of just like pulls the string tight or makes it hard to bend the string, however you want to think of it. Um, so what this does is it, um, it increases bias because look at the red dash line here and compare it to the curvy blue one. The dashed red line has a lot more bias because it's more simple. Um, on the other hand, there's gonna be a lot less variance because many different data sets are gonna give um, models that look a lot like that red dashed line, whereas the, the form of the blue line is very dependent on exactly what data points we happen to get in this training set. So by introducing regularization, we've We've made the bias go up, hopefully by not very much, but we've made the variance go down, hopefully by a lot. And so that is going to decrease the out of sample error. So he also has um, some other interesting plots here. Uh, this is just lasso. What, what we were looking at before is ridge regression. This is the picture for lasso regression. It's very similar. Um, but uh, He's talking about early stopping. We need to talk about early stopping. We might have to do two lessons on this. So I want to I want to look at these plots. It took me a long time to actually understand the meaning of these. They're not explained very well in the book. So you can see he's got um, this is lasso versus ridge. And remember, lasso and L1 penalty mean mean are sort of um, they go together. Um, so here's lasso. Here's ridge. Here's L2 penalty. Here's L1 penalty. So what, what he's showing here in, in this plot is he's letting these, these diamond-shaped contours, those are the contour lines for the L1 penalty. And he's picked a, a starting place here. And now in the background, um, the contours that are circular are just the ordinary, in, the ordinary error function. So it's just regular mean squared error. So he's, they're, they're expressed separately in this picture. So he's, he's picked a point here and he sort of let it go with respect to both surfaces. So that what the white line shows here is the ball, the ball rolling down toward the optimum of mean squared error, which is this point. And then what this, what this other line with the, the triangle shows is what happens if you let the ball run down the gradient that results results just from the L1 penalty. So here it's trying to minimize its L1 penalty. It's doing them independently in this picture. But over here on the right, this is the augmented error function that takes both the L1 penalty 
and the mean squared error into account and combines them. And you can see that it's kind of stretched out. Um, it's kind of uh, made, made the, the error contours for the augmented error look kind of more diamond shaped themselves. So this is what happens if you let the little ball go and roll down this gradient. It tends to um, get to zero on one axis. We said that would happen um, because in lasso regression, um, one of the di several dimensions of, of the parameter vector end up being set to zero. So this is what typically happens is it runs down here. But then something kind of annoying happens. Uh, if you, if you look at- Good question. Yeah. Um, so what can we tell the difference of the path, the way the, the let's say, quote unquote, the ball descends to, towards, um, towards the, um, the least error, I would say. Yeah, this is right like jigging, you know. So, how how does that play into effect in terms of like um, the bias and, and error sample and all that? Um, well, with uh, with our our yeah. So over here, this is the this red square is the true optimum. So there's no complexity penalty on this red one. That just optimizes mean squared error. But notice that when you do regularization what you get is a red square that it balances two, two constraints. One is that it wants to have a low mean squared error, but because of the regularization, it also wants to have no, it wants to have a low Manhattan distance from the origin. So that's why it came down to live on this axis because um, this is the sweet spot between punishing it for having a high mean squared error and punishing it for having a, um, a, a big Manhattan distance from the origin. So the Manhattan distance from the origin for this red square is low because it just has to go down this line to get to the origin. Whereas the Manhattan distance for this point is a little bit higher because it has to come down this line and then come over here to the origin. Um, one, one other bad thing about lasso, you can see that it's bouncing around quite a bit here. That's because if you take the, the derivative of the absolute value function, it's, uh, it's like negative one on one side and positive one on the other side. So it's, it's kind of discontinuous. And so that makes, uh, that makes the, once the ball ends up on one of these axes, it tends to bounce around. And so, you know, elastic net can help finish that, or, uh, improve that, or also a, a scheduling for the learning, a schedule for the learning rate so that you, um, you decrease the learning rate as you go along to, to make it jitter less. And um, so then based on this data set and these images, mm -hmm. so the L1 lesser would be better than L2 penalty ridge, right? Because the Manhattan distance would be shorter Compare, if you look at the second image, L2 yeah, penalty ridge, right. the Manhattan distance is longer from ridge compared to L2 penalty. And the Manhattan distance is shorter in, L, in lasso compared to L1 penalty. That, that's a good observation. But with, uh, with ridge regression, we, have a, we, have a, we, don't, we, don't, um, we don't penalize Manhattan distance, we penalize just Euclidean distance from the origin. So here's the original optimum. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Like the distance between the origin and and, um, and the point is different between L one and L two. Um, yeah, because there there are two different no notions of distance. So mm. this one this one is closer to the origin with respect to um, what we ordinarily understand ordinarily understand to be distance. You know, just the length of this line connecting it to the origin, and this one is closer with respect to Manhattan distance. And um, so I, I get what maybe you're saying is that this, this one is actually closer with respect to Euclidean distance too. And, um, and yeah, it looks, like, it looks like that's probably right, but it, it, might, it might not have as low a mean squared error as this one. So it's, a, it's always a trade-off between the two, but you're right, that is, that is um, something that is worth noticing. This is a, it's a similar story down here in the ridge case in the L2 penalty. These, these green arrows just let it roll right down the, um, uh, the L2 penalty and, and the white line just lets it min, uh, optimize mean squared error without constraint. And then here you combine the two. So this is the, this is the contour lines of the augmented error function that combines both. 
Okay. The, the mean squared the mean squared error is better in bridge compared to the one that is in the L2 penalty. Yeah, that, that does seem to be true. And um, so it might be that on this data set, Lasso does better. Um, but it, on other, it depends on the data set. Yeah, so how do, you, how do you decide which one to choose? So one thing you might do is just try it both ways. Um, but um, Lasso does not work well when you have um, kind of short <laughs> matrices, short wide matrices are not good for Lasso. Um, so in that case, you want to use ridge regression. Um, but lasso might be better if you have a feeling that there are just, you have like a lot of features and you have a feeling that just one or two of them might actually be important and the other ones might be junk. You know, so like, let's say that we want to, um, we want to understand the coronavirus better. So we get the, the deaths in the city data, but then we cross tabulate that with like tons of information from Wikipedia. So for every, every city or something, we get, the coronavirus numbers, but then we get like the GDP of the city, the population, the like political structure. We could add thousands of, of columns and almost all of them might be kind of irrelevant, but maybe Lasso could help us identify which of those features have um, the greatest influence on the target, which in that case would be the um, coronavirus infection rate or something. Um, so they're, they're a little bit different. We can, Try both, and and also if you if you have this book, I really can't do better than just reading the the chapter if you're interested in this kind of stuff. So that that's um that's regression. Let's look at some pictures from from classification. So um, are are you with me? I think you are. Okay. So this this is um this is uh, classification, and in this in this case, I'm just doing it with uh, logistic logistic. Uh, regression, which remember is actually classification. So I'm coming up with a classification boundary between um, these two data sets. And I just wanted to show you what they look like for, for more or less regularization. So alpha is the same thing as lambda. It's just the amount, uh, amount of regularization. It's the degree to which you are penalizing um, the complexity of the weight vector. And in this example, we're using um, L2 penalty. So this, this alpha is not penalizing um, complexity very much at all. So this is just sort of like the natural fit that um, logistic regression would find even if it were not being regularized. But now, and, and so here's the out of sample. I, I think this is actually just the end sample error. I, I, was, I put this together at the last minute. Maybe we should just change this now. Now watch it break. Okay. Um, so here's the um, the end sample error is is 10%. Now it, we we ratchet it up a little bit more. So now alpha is um, an order of magnitude greater. It's kind of hard to see, but you, the line is getting less curvy. And now the end sample error is, has changed to 11% or 12%. Well, so the end sample error also increases when the, the that's when that's true. The, so remember, we're, we're always going to minimize the end sample error when we have the curviest possible curve. Um, so if you, because you, the you, curve is flattens out, it increases. It increases the end sample error, but it, it may be reducing the out of sample error. So don't think, that the, don't think that the flatter curves are worse because what we're really looking at right now is performance on training data. And the training data error is always minimized by having the maximum possible variance. Um, but so that variance will come back to bite us though when we look at the out of sample error. Um, so here it's, here it's a little bit flatter, regularization is gone. Is, and, and so we're just upping the regularization and, and you can see that the, um, the bias of that curve is, is getting higher and higher because it's getting simpler and simpler. And at the end here, it's not really able to, uh, to, fit, the, to fit the data set. But let, let's look at that again. Um, but this time, let's consider what happens to out of sample error. So we'll just go through this worksheet. So here are um, a couple of blobs of data. It's kind of like two like pa pieces of Paisley um, together, or like the yin yang symbol. They call it the moon's data set. Um, so there's the there's what we're going to use as the training training data. 
and I'm just using um, logistic re regression here. So initially, I just do logistic regression with the um, with the dimensionality of the data set. So that finds a line. So this is the best line, the best separating line, but um, it's not really linearly separable. So the error here is is kind of high. Um, what this plot is is um, remember logistic regression predicts probabilities. So over here, it's predicting a probability of zero, and over here, it's predicting a probability of one, and these other levels are somewhere in between. But then I just, in this second picture, we threshold it and just make it choose, and that's what we call the hard boundary. Um, so now let's go up to features that are degree five polynomial features. And now this is this is the unregularized um, degree five polynomial feature fit, and the error is a lot lower. So the n sample error has gone down to it's like half of what it was before. Um, okay, so what are we going to do now? Now let's try to to compare the out of sample error. So, but to to approximate what the out of sample error is, I just generated more data using this using the same probability distribution. And so the, you know, with this, this is a good thing about high bias, you know, simple, simple shapes, the in sample error tends to be a good approximation of the out of sample error. And it doesn't change much for just the, um, the regular line. And here is the, um, the fifth degree curve that we found. So now that what we're going to consider to be the out of sample error here is cha has changed to 9.6%. Um, so that's, that's how well that thing does out of sample. But now I want to try a different, a different strategy for building a model. Um, what I'm going to do is with the, with the original data, this Z original is, is the original training data, I'm going to, I'm going to make a bunch of different models um, that have different levels of, of regularization. Um, oh, no. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, all right. And uh, I just need to go through here. So, um, so this, what I've done here is I, I, with Z, Z original, so I, we trained on the training set. We trained on the training, training data, um, but we did it with different levels of, of regularization. And, um, Here's, here's, here's where the, the level of regularization is being determined in this first line. So what I'm just doing is I'm trying a bunch of, I'm trying to make the regularization parameter a bunch of different powers of 10. So it's gonna try 10 to the negative sixth, 10 to the negative fifth, 10 to the negative fourth, 10 to the negative third, and so on. So those are the, the levels of uh, regularization that we're gonna, we're gonna attempt. And with, with the pictures that we go through are gonna show is out of sample performance. <laughs> Okay, so let's go. So here is 10 to the minus sixth. The out of sample performance is um, 0.98. Remember the number to beat is 0.96, I think, right? Um, not sure why I put that so far up. No, here it is. So this is the number to beat, 0.96, okay? So it's just a little bit of regularization. Uh, we, don't, we don't beat it, we get 0.98. Now we use a little bit um, more regularization, and that gives us um, again 0.98. So now we use um, a little bit more regularization, and there we actually we do make an improvement. The out of sample error goes down to um, 0.95, and you know theoretically that's because this has less variance and and only a little bit more bias. And then we keep we keep introducing more and more regularization, but after that point, it stops paying off. So this goes back above 0.96, and then the curve gets too simple, and the out of sample error starts to to creep up. So there's a there's like a, an ideal an, an ideal amount of regularization to use, and you just have to write a little loop to check the orders of magnitude for the regularization parameter and find the one that that seems to have the best out, out of sample performance. And the way you evaluate that is by using the test set. And there's a little penalty you pay because now this hyperparameter has been, has been it depends on the test set. So um, 
it's still the best model, but the out of sample error might it's a, it's it's become a slightly slightly optimistic estimator of the out of sample error because you tuned it using the the test data. That's a good question. So the in sample error is from the test, and the out of sample error is from the actual data itself. That's right. That's right. Really, it comes from the probability distribution that generates the data, but. Um, you, if you just if you just have enough data, then then you know the just the sample average is going to be the same as the true average. And so our strategy for checking out of sample error was just to um, to make more data because we could do it. But in a real world scenario, what you'll do is is just use the um, the test set as a stand in for um, for for out of sample error. Okay, and I'm going to, oh, we've already taken attendance, so I could keep talking if I wanted to. What should I say? I don't know. Um, I, I you, do said, you, you said uh, when the, the, the car was getting flatter, uh -huh. should, uh, like we shouldn't like, um, we shouldn't look at the, I think the insensible error, like it was getting bigger, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. and you said now that we use that in a real life world scenario, when, you, when we use the insensible error for a test, mm -hmm. I guess that's the out of sample error. Like, um, can you like uh, just uh, talk more about that? Yeah, so sure. So, so let's consider this this very first one here. So this one is pretty close to unregularized. So this point uh, nine, this model probably has the lowest in sample error because it has the most variance. So it's going to overfit the training data the most. Um, now, as we as we force the curve to be more stiff, that's going to make the training error worse because the stiffer curve is not going to be able to put every point on the right side of the boundary but at the same time it's not overfitting the training data either so as this curve gets stiffer the end sample error on the training set will get worse um, but the out of sample performance on the test set will get better so this model how come we are overfitting when the when the curve gets uh, curvier? We are not overfitting when the curve gets more rigid. Or... Um, yeah, it's it's uh, you know, like if you can imagine like a really ridiculous, uh, you could you could come up with some ridiculous curve that just goes like around, like something a kid might draw. You know, like a curve that just goes around every single blue point. Um, that's going to have zero um, zero in sample error, but it is really really specific to um, the the data that we happen to get to be our training set. Um, so you you what you want your learning model to do is to sort of like understand the probability distribution that's generating these points, not these particular points, because this is just like um, yeah, not only for the blue points, right? Yeah, right. Or yeah, or you know, you could draw it around the orange, orange too. Um, so you you don't want your hypothesis hypothesis to be like something that that works just exactly for the training data that you have. You want it to be something that's going to work well for like the average training set that you might have. So when you have a when you have like a a flatter curve, then that works better. You know, it might work better on average than something that, that gives you zero training error here just because you've put a line around every single blue dot. So that's that's kind of what overfitting is, is, is when your your model kind of has zero training error because you've just come, come up with some crazy curve that makes this really complex separation that works well on that training set, but it won't work well on other training sets that are just you know, drawn from the same distribution. Got it. Okay, so of course we didn't get we didn't get too far, but I think we did pretty good. And I know that we still went, went really fast. Um, so if that was too fast, you might want to go back and watch the uh, the videos. But class is over. We ended up getting sixteen people here. Hello, if you weren't here when I took attendance at the beginning. Um, okay, anybody? Oh, hey, professor, I don't think I was there when you took attendance in the beginning. Uh, okay, who said that? Um, Romerson. 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 Okay, I'll I'll put you down, but. Right. Okay. And, and you, you know, I don't mind doing that because you showed up on Tuesday. 
Yeah, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so I'll be in touch if anybody wants to to chat on on CoCalc or um, Zoom. We can we can set it up. Just send me an email. And uh, next week we won't meet, but I'll I'll still be producing one. some stuff for you guys. One. Uh, Shipu. Oh, hello. Oh, so my crypto students are showing up now. <laughs> so I have to say goodbye. Uh, good, goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Professor. Yeah. Bye.